Well, hey, family of grace, welcome to our online campus. I'm so glad to be worshiping with you here today. Uh, If you're new here, I want to remind you we are a gospel-centered multi-campus church on the central coast of California, and our mission is all about helping people find and follow Jesus. Uh, I'm Pastor Chris. I'm our online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. I'm really glad to be worshiping with you here today. Um, Something I've been really encouraged by lately and want to continue to remind you uh, at the online campus, whether you're worshiping at a microsite or you're worshiping at home in your living room, uh, wherever you are worshiping right now, you are worshiping with the rest of your church family, even though you can't feel them and see them right there. One way that you can feel that a little bit in the morning uh, while you're worshiping or whenever you're worshiping is you can uh, text a friend and let them know that you're um, worshiping. You can it, plan a time to worship together online, even separately. I know that sounds silly, um, but it's a way to connect over what's happening. I'm often, while I'm worshiping at our Five Cities campus on Sunday mornings, um, interacting with friends who are worshiping at Slow, and we're talking about what's happening in the message. Another way to do it on Sunday morning in particular is to go to gracecentralcoast.org and worship online there, where you can hop in the chat and talk with other people who are worshiping with you right then. So just want to remind you, uh, our church There are so many worshiping right now with you. And all those worshiping are reading from God's word, hearing the same message. We're going to do that now. We're going to read Psalm 105 uh, with our church family. So would would you read this aloud with me as we take a moment to reorient our heart posture Um, We take all the things of our week, and we take all the things in our mind, the little things, the big things, the heavy things, the joys and delights, and let's place them before the Lord in response and worship. Let's read from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Let's worship him now. We will 
Shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O Lord of all the earth. We shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh. To shout your name, O Lord Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name, O Lord Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name, O Lord together today as we worship. Say, anywhere you are, I want to be there. Anywhere you are, I want to be there. It's written on my heart. You're all I've ever needed. Anywhere you go, I want to be there. It's written on my soul. You're all I ever needed. my heart, you're all I've 
And Lord, as we continue worshiping right now through hearing from your word, hearing uh, as we're in this text about the faith uh, of old, would that faith continue here and now in us and your congregation, that we would trust you more, that our faith would abound in you because of your faithfulness, because of your consistency in loving us. Would you uh, bless our hearts with your word, uh, bless our souls, bless our community uh, with your word, and challenge us forward uh, in next steps and following through with what your word has called us to do as we continue worshiping. In your son's name and for your glory, amen. Hello, Grace Central Coast. I'm Al Streeter. I'm the Adults and Missions Pastor here at Grace Central Coast, and it's great to be with you uh, for the online service this week. We uh, move to a, a time of giving back, which, which is an opportunity to give. And there are three ways that you can give. You see the, the options on your screen. Uh, one of the things that we really like to do in this segment is to talk about, talk stories, uh, so that you see how your giving is actually advancing the gospel and helping people to find and follow Jesus. If you're new to Grace, we want to just say welcome. We're not asking you to give. We're just glad that you're worshiping with us this week. One of the beautiful things about Grace Central Coast is that we're a multi-generational church family. Every age and stage of life is, is represented here. And we believe that intergenerational worship is vital and it really gives an accurate and vibrant picture of what church community is meant to be. This week, we want to highlight our Grace Seniors. We love it when our campuses online, North County, Five Cities, and the Slow Campuses all come together for events. And just last month, our Grace Seniors gathered for a Valentine's luncheon that included music and uh, mutual uh, encouragement. 77 Grace Seniors representing all the campuses met at the Slow Campus. They partied with an amazing lunch made by Daryl Daniels and his crew, and dessert was provided by Ellie Claith and Kathy Keel, and they were serenaded by Bill Ziegler on his soprano saxophone. So a fun time had by all. In keeping with Valentine's Day, uh, the group celebrated multi-decade marriages and the stories of how people met and memorable Valentine's Days. And there was some laughter at some of the days that uh, Valentine's days that didn't go quite according to plan, but it uh, and it was also a chance to give thanks for loving and faithful marriages, but it was also a chance to give thanks for God's even greater love and faithfulness to us. One of the things that we're working on with the seniors ministry is a, a new caring callers uh, uh, team. This would be a group of people who will call and, and encourage some of those who may be more isolated or have special needs. Um, and we, give, we thank you because you're making these kinds of things possible, our gathering events, but also ministries like Caring Callers. We thank you for your faithful giving towards Grace, and uh, uh, we appreciate that. And why don't you join me now as we go to prayer. Lord, we give you thanks this morning that you've placed us into community. And we're so blessed that we, we are in a, a community that is, uh, is multi-generational. We have the young families and the babies and uh, high schoolers and college students, seniors, the whole, the whole spectrum. And that's a blessing. And it, it really is an enriching kind of environment for us, and we give you thanks for it. We pray, Lord, that you would help all of us, no matter what stage of life we're at, to have an influence on the community around us, that the people that we know, that we can uh, touch with the gospel, that more people in the Central Coast would find and follow Jesus. We think, too, of, of our op opportunity as a church to support global missions, and we think of uh, Mark Peaster, who we uh, uh, we pray for this week, who works with Russian children and elderly. Um, he spends a lot of his time here and then travels periodically there. Obviously, in this time, this really troubling time, uh, we pray for special uh, guidance for him, that he would know how to serve and give him ways to serve 
uh, even as he's here in the States. We think of those who are uh, struggling in Ukraine. Uh, we, we just pray for that whole situation. We know we have families and friends who are, are there in Central Europe. And so, Lord, we pray that your hand would be on this situation, that you would bring it to a close. Uh, you are sovereign. You are in control. And so, Lord, we pray your mercy on this part of the world. We think of those we know. I think of uh, Jim and Ruth and Lisa Overton, who uh, had to re relocate to Poland from uh, Kiev. And so, Lord, we pray that you would uh, give them safety, but also may they have a fruitful ministry where they are. Use them, Lord, to be a blessing uh, as they seek to help refugees who have come to Poland. We think of Jake Knotts and uh, uh, Jake, who's also in Poland uh, working with refugees, trying to, to bring people out of Ukraine, and uh, Nathan Phillips and Seth, two more young men who uh, traveled from the Five Cities campus to join Jake. We just pray your hand would be upon them, that you get grant safety, that there would be fruit, fruitfulness in what they do. I think of Anya, Jake's wife, who uh, whose mom is, is still in Ukraine. We pray that you would bring comfort to uh, the, uh, the Knotts family. We pray that you would bring uh, Anya's mom safely out of Ukraine. And uh, we just pray for comfort and peace uh, uh, for them. Lord, we, uh, we just give you thanks that you are in control. We trust our lives with you. We pray that as we serve, as we give even this week in the offering, that you would take these gifts, uh, that you would multiply them, use them to advance your kingdom, that many more would find and follow Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take your Bible now and turn to Hebrews 11? We're going to read from verse 4. We'll read uh, verses 4 to 7, Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the, for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, welcome today. Thanks for worshiping with us at Grace Central Coast. If you're worshiping with us up in the North County, down in five cities in downtown Slow or online, we're so glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us, we hope that you experience a warm welcome in our church. We are in a long study of the book of Hebrews, but we've just started a fun little series within a series as we're spending some time here in Hebrews chapter 11. Last week, we saw what faith is in the first three verses and verse six. Do you remember faith? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And we looked at four truths about faith. Do you remember what we learned last week? Here they are. Living by faith involves actively trusting God, God's word, and the gospel. Living by faith involves a steadfast confidence in the future promises of God. Living by faith involves a steadfast confidence in the unseen realities of God. And most important of all, faith is what delights God. This is what faith is. It's what we looked at last week. Now, the rest of Hebrews 11 is going to show us what faith looks like in the lives of real people all across the Bible. And the purpose of all these examples of living faith from biblical history is to inspire and motivate and stir us up toward a living, enduring faith in our lives today. 
Uh, so quickly, jump to Hebrews 12 and look with me at the big charge and challenge. I really think it's the climax of the book. It's actually been our benediction across our, he- our, our Hebrew series. So Hebrews chapter 12, take a look at it with me. It begins like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that's what we see in chapter 11. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is the race of faith that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And so that's what the middle of chapter 11 shows us. That's what we're going to see over the next few weeks. This cloud of witnesses that now surround us. Those who have run the race of faith before us, but now are seated in the stands of the stadium, cheering us on as we run our race of faith. That's the picture here. So today, let's meet three of these faithful witnesses. If you haven't yet, would you please open a Bible with me to Hebrews 11. Grab that outline in your worship folder. Take some notes today. We believe that you're going to get more out of today's message if you do both those things. If your eyes are on the text of the Bible and if you write something down today. And so we kick things off with the living faith of Abel. Abel's sad story is told in the early verses of Genesis chapter 4. So would you keep your finger here in Hebrews 11 and turn back to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis chapter 4. First, we're going to read Abel's story back in Genesis, and then we're going to see how Hebrews 11 helps us understand it. Cain and Abel were the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Abel, we're told, was a keeper of flocks, a rancher, while Cain was a keeper of fields, a farmer. And here's what we read about these two in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. It's a challenging story that at first glance begs one big question, and here it is. What was right with Abel and his offering, and what was wrong with Cain and his offering? Now, Genesis doesn't directly tell us, but it does show us some clues. It's actually Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, which gives us a head start in answering the question. So now turn back to Hebrews 11 and take a look. Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So what was right about Abel and his sacrifice? Abel's heart of faith. Hebrews 11 verse 4 tells us that when Abel came to worship, when he came to worship the Lord, he came in a posture of faith. He came with an attitude of faith. Genesis 4.4 specifically tells us that the Lord had regard for Abel first and then his offering. The Lord had no regard for Cain nor his offering. What was the main difference between the brothers? 
As we'll see, their physical sacrifices were different, but the reason their physical sacrifices were, was dif- were different was because their hearts first were different. The first difference, the main difference between the two was the attitude, the posture of their respective hearts. Abel came by faith. The text of Hebrews 11 tells us explicitly, which means that Cain did not come by faith. Remember, living by faith involves trusting God, his word, and the gospel. So was Abel trusting God? Was Abel trusting God's word and the gospel? I'm convinced that he was, based on several clues in the larger Genesis story to this point. Remember, at the tragic fall of Adam and Eve, remember, at their sin, Abel's parents... Uh, Adam and Eve, God expelled them from his garden of delight, from the garden of Eden. He cursed humankind, God did, and the earth with them. And so all our relationships would now, because of sin, be marked by striving and, and really a strife. Because of sin, work would now be hard and sweaty. Because of sin, the earth thorny and weedy. But even in the midst of the curse and punishment, God gave a future promise of a coming Savior in Genesis 3.15. The seed of a woman who would one day come to crush the head of the serpent, the evil one. And then God, we're told, did an, uh, an intriguing thing. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and he clothed them. Adam and Eve, after their sin, tried to cover up their guilt and shame with fig leaf coverings of their own making. But God now replaces those leaf coverings with skins of animals. God himself must cover their sin, guilt, and shame. And notice, it happens through a death sacrifice. An animal dies to cover Adam and Eve's sin. Sin requires sacrifice. Do you see God right at the start of sin demonstrates and establishes a principle and a pattern, a principle and a pattern that will be seen and taught across all the Bible, climaxing in the perfect and final, the true and better sacrifice of Jesus, the long promised savior, which the author of Hebrews has spent so much time highlighting throughout this book. Now, what did Abel know of all this? What what connections did he know and what connections did he see? Probably not a lot. But I'm personally convinced that Abel knew this Savior promise and Abel knew this sacrifice principle. He was trusting God and his future promise. He was trusting God and the unseen reality and power of sacrifice. And so Abel's heart of faith, he was trusting God and trusting God's word. Abel's heart of faith produced Abel's worship by faith. Abel offered to God a blood sacrifice that was pleasing to God. He came to worship God in the way that God prescribed. He came aware of his sin and offering to God the first and the best of his flock as a blood sacrifice that God demanded for the covering and payment of his sin. Abel worshipped God, God's way. Cain, by contrast, came to worship God in his own way, the way that he thought best, not the way prescribed. Cain did not come in faith, And Cain did not bring a blood sacrifice. That would likely have required him to go to his brother who kept the flocks. And Cain didn't want to do that. And so Cain brought what he had, not what God required. Cain rejected God's word and God's way in favor of his own. Cain rejected the Savior promise and the sacrifice principle. The book of Jude speaks of those who reject God's word and God's ways as those who walk in the way of Cain. 
What's so striking in the Genesis text is that God gives Cain a warning and a second chance to get it right. Look at it again. Genesis 4, verse 6. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? The Lord is saying, Cain, repent and try again. Get your heart right and then get your offering right. But Cain, in his stubborn pride, refuses And instead, in a fit of jealous rage, Cain murders his brother Abel. When God confronts him, Cain lies and he pleads his innocence. But God says to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now, look at how the author of Hebrews riffs on that statement. And through his faith, that is Abel's faith, though he died, he still speaks. Did you catch what the the author of Hebrews is saying? It's not now the blood of Abel that speaks from the ground. It's the faith of Abel that speaks. And it's speaking to us even right now today, isn't it? This is Abel's witness of faith. His faith is speaking to you and I today. And what is Abel's faith telling us? Well, Abel's faith is telling us that the nature of faith is inside out. Faith begins in the heart, on the inside, but it always produces something on the outside of our lives. Abel, Abel's faith is telling us that God cares first and, mo- at first and most about the, the faith attitude and the posture of our hearts. Abel's faith is speaking to us, telling us that God also cares about how we come to him in worship. Not our own way, but his way. And his way for us now is by faith in the blood sacrifice of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice that God himself offered to cover our sin once and for all. The faith of Abel still speaks all these truths, and especially this one, Abel's righteousness by faith. So look at the first part of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, once more. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. Uh, The phrase I want you to think about with me is, through which he was commended as righteous. First of all, what is the which that is commended as righteousness? Was it Abel's heart of faith or was it Abel's offering of faith? The answer is yes, it was Abel's faith that was commended. First in the heart, second in action. That was commended as righteous. But what does that mean? That his faith was commended as righteousness. It means what we saw last week, that Abel's faith pleased God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God looked on Abel's faith and he declared Abel righteous or in a right standing before him. By his faith, Abel was justified before God. He was declared righteous by God. It wasn't Abel's righteousness. It was God's righteousness that God credited to Abel's account because on the basis of his faith, because his faith pleased God. That's the living faith of Abel. In Abel, we see here a pattern that now we're going to see in the next two figures mentioned here in Hebrews 11. So here's the pattern. An inward heart of faith produces an outward action by faith and a witness of faith, and all of that results in a righteousness by faith. Okay, so let me say that again. An inward heart of faith produces an outward action by faith and a witness of faith, and all of that results in a righteousness by faith. That's the pattern. Now let me show it to you again. This time in the living faith of Enoch. Now, who in the world is Enoch? Well, this time, just for kicks, let's start in Hebrews. Let's start with Hebrews 11, verse 5, and then work backwards together. 
Okay, so Hebrews 11, verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Who is this guy, Enoch? And what does this mean? Well, Enoch's story is told back in Genesis chapter 5. Cain's murder of Abel in Genesis 4 unleashes an era of great wickedness upon the earth. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of years. That eventually leads to God's judgment flood in Genesis 6. But with the birth of Seth to Adam and Eve at the end of Genesis 4, we learn that something significant and hopeful begins to happen. The text tells us this. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. While everyone else across the world was seeking their own selfish interests, their own evil interests, this family, the, the family line of Seth, began to seek the Lord by faith. And Enoch was a member of this godly family of faith. And here's what we learn about Enoch in Genesis 5. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Did you catch it? Something significant happened in Enoch's life at age 65. We don't know exactly what it was, but we know that Enoch had some sort of encounter with God. How do we know that? We know that because Enoch, we know that Enoch had some kind of encounter with God because Enoch names his newborn son Methuselah, which in Hebrew means his death will bring it. Enoch's Methuselah lives the longest life of anyone recorded in the Bible. It's a sign of God's grace. For in the year Methuselah dies, it happens. His death brings it. The flood comes. What was Enoch's encounter with God? I'm convinced that somehow, some way, God showed Enoch that the flood was coming. That's why Enoch named his son Methuselah, and that's why Enoch began to walk with God at age 65. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, translates this Hebrew phrase, Enoch walked with God, trans that phrase, translates that phrase as Enoch pleased God. And we know that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Something happened in Enoch's heart, a shift in attitude, a shift in posture. You see, this verse is telling us about Enoch's heart of faith. The faith of his family at age 65 became now Enoch's own faith. He believed God's word about a future promised Savior. I believe that that, that promise was passed down through Seth's family. He believed God's word about a terrible unseen reality that was coming, a judgment flood. What began inwardly, for Enoch in his heart began to impact how he lived outwardly. Enoch's heart of faith produced Enoch's walk by faith. Enoch began to walk with God by faith at age 65. When most of the world around him were doing what was right in their own eyes and as Genesis 6 describes, they were doing evil continually. Enoch began to seek God and walk in the ways of God. And Enoch walked with God for the next, did you catch it, 300 years. Talk about an enduring faith. That's a long time. And then one day, Enoch suddenly disappeared because God took him. Enoch is one of only two figures in the Bible who didn't die because God took them to heaven. Elijah is the other. But there's something else to know about Enoch. The book of Jude records that Enoch was a prophet who spoke of the coming judgment of God. Take a look. 
Jude verses 14 and 15. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness. You see, Jude tells us of Enoch's witness of faith. Enoch's heart of faith. It produced a walk of faith. And it also produced this too, a witness of faith. Enoch began to share what God had revealed to him. He began to warn about God's coming judgment and plead with his neighbors to turn back to God and to call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm sure that those neighbors thought that Enoch was nuts, cuckoo for cocoa puffs, but not God. God was delighted and pleased with Enoch's heart of faith which produced a walk of faith and a witness of faith. And that's why God took Enoch. Hebrews 11.5 tells us, By faith, or because of his faith, Enoch was taken up. Before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. It's another statement indicating Enoch's righteousness by faith. Enoch's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Enoch gained a right standing before God, not because he was righteous, but because God declared him righteous on the basis of his faith. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's Abel. That's Enoch. Are you seeing what faith looks like? Are you seeing the pattern? A heart of faith produces a life of faith and a witness of faith that results in a righteousness by faith. That's the pattern. Let's see it one more time, even more sharply now, in the living faith of Noah. Now, most of us are much more familiar with the life of Noah, the story of Noah, than with the stories of Abel and Enoch. And so we don't need to go back to Genesis. Hebrews reminds us of all we need to know about Noah. Here it is, Hebrews chapter 4, I mean, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. God spoke to Noah about a coming judgment, a flood that would wipe out the entire world. God also spoke to Noah about a promise of salvation for Noah and his family and animals of every kind. But God also spoke to Noah about something he must do. Noah and his family would be saved, the earth would be saved, if Noah would build a massive boat according to God's exact specifications. Noah responded with a heart of faith. Noah's heart responded with belief and trust. He trusted God and God's word. Noah exercised a steadfast confidence in the unseen realities of God, the judgment flood that was coming and a steadfast confidence in the future promises of God, that God would one day save he and his family through this judgment. And so Noah started building. By faith and in reverent fear, I think those two are interchangeable terms here, Noah constructed the ark. We see it again. Noah's heart of faith produced Noah's obedience by faith. What a long, long, long obedience it was. Talk about an enduring faith. Noah would labor by faith on that big old boat for 120 years before it was finally completed. 120 years. It's said at least three times in Noah's story in Genesis 7. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. He obeyed God completely and in every detail, day after day, year after year, for more than a century. 
Can you imagine what Noah's neighbors thought? Can you imagine what Noah's neighbors said and how they laughed? What are you doing, Noah? I'm building an ark. A what? A big boat. Why, Noah? Why are you doing this? Because God's judgment flood is coming. Because of the sins of the world. But it's not too late. There's room for you in this boat. But you've got to repent and turn to God. Noah, you are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Noah, you're crazy. And oh, how they laughed. We know that conversations like this happened between Noah and his neighbors because Peter refers to Noah as a herald of righteousness, a proclaimer of righteousness. And in this we see, too, Noah's witness of faith. Noah's life and his words reflected and expressed his heart of faith. He not only believed God and his word himself, he invited and urged others around him to believe God and his word as well. But apparently, no one listened. No one around him responded to God and his word. No one repented and believed. Hebrews 11, verse 7 says, By this meaning by his faith, in heart and action, word and deed, Noah condemned the world. Those were 120 years of God's grace and invitation, but no one repented. And so their condemnation, God's judgment was sealed. Eventually the animals came. They obeyed God's word, even though the humans would not. And then it started raining, and it kept raining. The rains came down, and the floods came up. Hebrews 11, verse 7, records in its last phrase, Noah became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah's heart of faith produced an obedience by faith and a witness of faith, And all of this resulted in Noah's righteousness by faith. Noah became an heir. Think about an inheritance. An heir is somebody who receives an inheritance. An inheritance is not something that's earned. An inheritance is something that's given and received. Noah was not himself righteous. Later events in his life clearly demonstrate that. But God's righteousness was bequeathed to Noah. He inherited it. He was declared righteous in God's sight because of and by his faith. Brothers and sisters, this is what faith looks like. Faith begins inwardly in the heart. Our attitude and posture before God and in response to his word. But faith doesn't end there. Faith always works itself outwardly in our lives. In worship, in a walk, in obedience, and in a witness to others. And all of this results in a righteousness by faith. Not a righteousness of our own that we earn, but a righteousness that God graciously gives, a righteousness that God declares over our lives, a righteousness that God credits to our accounts, a right standing before God, a righteousness on the basis of faith. This is what faith looks like. And so what about our faith, yours and mine? We must examine our hearts. Do we really believe and trust God and his word? His future promises, his unseen realities. Do we trust Jesus, his son and sacrifice? We must examine our hearts. We must examine our lives too. Do we worship God by faith? Do we come to God God's way? Through Jesus, do we walk with God daily in the circumstances of our lives? Whatever those circumstances are in the crazy, hostile, uncertain world of today. I mean, that's the world we're living in. But those guys were too. Are we obeying God, doing all that God asks, 
doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly before our God. You see, this is what faith looks like. But what about our faith? Does our faith look like this? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. The reward of faith is the righteousness of God. And it's ours. We can be confident and trust that righteousness is ours. Not because we've earned it, but because God has given it because of our faith. And this righteousness of God can be yours today if you will trust and seek him. Like Abel, like Enoch, and like Noah. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you for the richness of your word. We thank you for the lives of these faithful men. We thank you for that worship by faith in Abel's life. We thank you for that long walk of faith in Enoch's life. We thank you for that long obedience of faith by faith in Noah's life. Lord, we we just thank you that you show us what faith looks like. And now, may we just continue to, to examine our own hearts and our own lives, because that's what your word ought to cause us to do. We just want to sit in this examination, even as we worship and as we fellowship together and as we leave this place and as we enjoy this Lord's day that you've given us, this Sunday, to rest and reflect. And as we gather this week in our growth groups, we want to sit in that question, examining our hearts and our lives, our own faith. Would you grow in your people here at Grace Central Coast? This enduring faith, the faith that looks like this, begins in the heart, works itself out in our lives and in our witness. We just thank you that by faith you declare us righteous in Jesus. We pray for any who don't know that, any who aren't sure of that righteousness, may they today heed the challenge, the call of your word today. It was the same call. To Cain, it's the same, it was the same call to the people around Enoch. It was the same call to the people around Noah to repent and turn to you. We just pray that those who might be listening today who haven't done that, that you draw them. You'd show them what that looks like. And they would do it. They would repent and trust and seek you and find Jesus as they do. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, family of grace, let's go out uh, with faith uh, that leads to a response. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. Before we do that, uh, we have a couple things. One is a next step. Here it is. Uh, This week, since heart faith will produce practical action and a living witness, encourage a Christian friend in our church family by sharing the action of faith and witness uh, of faith you see in their life. Does that make sense? Um, Let's do that this week. Let's reach out to someone in our church community um, and encourage them in faith. Also wanted to let you know that we have a baby, a new baby at our North County campus. Uh, Avia Hill uh, was born this past week and this picture is so cute. And I was talking earlier about how this picture reminds me of when my daughter was born and we would unswaddle her and she puts her hands up and so sweet. So happy for that family. With that, why don't you stand wherever you're at? Uh, Let's go out into our week together by reading with and to each other God's word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Have a great week, church. Hi, kids. I'm Emily, the Grace Kids Coordinator at North County Campus. We're so glad you're with us today. 
we're going to sing some songs, watch a Bible story video, and hear some questions from kids. So let's get started. Knock, knock. Who's there? Figs. Figs who? Figs your doorbell. It's broken. Hey, kids, it's time for sing-along songs, the part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. And today, I've got a special treat for you. What's that? Well, it's a song called the sing-along song. What? I know. Your mind's going to be blown. That's crazy. All right, it goes like this. This is a song you can sing along. Just make sure you don't get the words wrong. It's super easy. Just follow along and sing the words with me. Bureaucratic, Adriatic, cryptocurrency, Annabella, Parabellum, Laryngoscopy, Ethnogeographical, Michelangelo, Intermittent Aberration, Elongated Toe. That was a song that's already half gone. The second part, you just sing along. Just remember your training and fall in line and sing along with me. Maharaja, Sectum, Sempra, Macedonia, Disambiguation, Mycoplasmatasia, Countertops, Triceratops, Megalomaniac, Anchorman, Afghanistan, Habakkuk, Hakmatak. God's people were near the land of Canaan. This was the promised land, the place God said Abraham's descendants would one day live. The Israelites had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The older generation had died. Moses, their leader, had died too. And now it was time for the remaining people to go into the land. God chose Joshua to be the new leader of Israel. It was a big job, but God encouraged Joshua. He promised to give Joshua success in the land. God said, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you, just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Then God said, be strong and courageous. God wanted Joshua to lead the people into the land because he had promised it to his people. God said, be strong and very courageous to obey everything Moses taught you. Study, remember, and obey the commands written in the book of instruction. If you do this, you will be successful in whatever you do. God encouraged Joshua again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever you go. So Joshua sent a message throughout the Israelites' camp. Get ready! We are going to cross the Jordan River and take this land. God is giving it to us, just like he promised. The Israelites agreed and got ready. We will do everything you have commanded us, they told Joshua. We will go everywhere you send us. We will obey you like we obeyed Moses. We trust that God will be with you like he was with Moses. God encouraged Joshua and promised to be with him as he led the Israelites into the Promised Land, where they would be victorious and find rest. We have victory over sin and rest for our souls in Jesus, who is always with us and leads us into the Promised Land of God's Kingdom. Hi there, I'm Pastor Kevin. It's time for questions from kids. Jonathan from St. Cloud, Minnesota asks, My brother always points out when I make a mistake. It makes me so mad. What should I do? Oh, that is a good question. You know, first, I am so sorry that he points out all of your mistakes. People point out mistakes for, for many reasons. Sometimes people point out mistakes because they want to hurt your feelings. And then sometimes people point out mistakes because they actually want to help you get better. So pointing out mistakes is often mean and it's, and it's not okay. You see, the Lord tells us that 
when we get mad, that's a natural human response, but we should not sin in our anger. So being mad is a human response, but don't sin in your anger. So, so what should you do? I think you should love your brother anyway. Love him. The Lord tells us in the scripture that when people are unkind to us, that we should still in return be kind to them. We should, you should treat your brother the way that you want to be treated. Now, Jesus Christ was a perfect example. He was a perfect model of this. People were cruel to him. They were mean to him. They said harsh things to him. People even lied on Jesus Christ. And you know what he did? He loved them anyway. He loved them, loved us so much that he laid down his, his life for us. Now, if it gets to the point where you're really uncomfortable, I would also encourage you to, to tell a trusted adult that your brother is saying hurtful or harmful things to you uh, that's making you mad. You see, it's always good to remember not to sin in our anger and to love people as much as we can. You see, God will be with you even when people treat you, uh, even when people treat you mean and they say harsh and harmful things to you. Remember this, words have power and we should choose our words really, really carefully and so I want to encourage you to use words that are kind and that encourage people. So let me ask you this question. How can you use your words to encourage and build others up? Hey, that's it for our show today, kids. As usual, we're going to close things out by singing Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. How should we sing it today, Josh? Well, Nick, I was thinking I've got the hat, so... Let's do a cowboy style. Cowboy, country cowboy style. Yeah. Nice and low, nice and low and gravelly. Let's do it on three, ready? One, two, three. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Bit more of a creed vibe, but still good. See you guys next time. We're so glad you were with us today. We're committed to helping kids find and follow Jesus. For further resources, you can visit gracecentralcoast.org. See you later.